claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. Strong words from the New York State Attorney General, who today filed a $250 million civil lawsuit against former President Donald Trump and his adult children, accusing them of overvaluing Trump properties, inflating his net worth, and cheating lenders. Now the investigation is being referred to the Manhattan DA and IRS for possible criminal charges. Tonight, how the Trump family is responding. And breaking tonight, an appeals court lifts the hold that kept the Justice Department from using classified records taken from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home in an investigation into mishandled documents, what it means for the Justice Department's probe. Fear and fleeing. Russians are scrambling to book flights out of the country as Vladimir Putin promises to mobilize 300,000 reservists to continue his war in Ukraine and appears to threaten a nuclear strike on national TV. President Biden's response in front of the United Nations. More pain for your pocket. The Federal Reserve hiked interest rates for a third time in a row in an effort to slow near historic inflation. How much more you'll be paying for credit cards, car loans, and mortgages. Taking the race to November, literally. I laced up my sneakers to meet Texas gubernatorial candidate Beto O'Rourke for a run and to have an in-depth conversation about his campaign, the aftermath of the horror in Uvalde, and his position on abortion and gay marriage. So you ran for Senate, ran for president, now running for governor. I take it you like to run. <laughs> well, I want to serve. This is a big moment of truth for us. A legendary king, Mexican ranchera titan Vicente Fernandez's life, now a Netflix series, portrayed by Jane the Virgin actor Jaime Camille, who tried mastering the icon's persona and voice. He caressed songs like in, in a very like, este amor apasiona. You know, the cadence of, of how he sang, that was very important for me to, to imprint in the recording. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following breaking news tonight. A panel of judges has granted a request from the Justice Department to stay portions of a ruling by a Florida judge that had effectively paused the government's investigation into former President Trump's potential mishandling of classified records after leaving office. The three-judge panel, comprised of two Trump appointees and an Obama appointee, ruled unanimously the DOJ is no longer prevented from using the documents with classifications recovered from Mar-a-Lago and will no longer have to submit them to special master Deary for review. In the ruling, they say Trump, quote, has not even attempted to show that he has a need to know the information contained in the classified documents. They also agree with the DOJ that the Trump team submitted no record or claim that he ever declassified the documents at issue. For more on this breaking development, we're joined once again by ABC News contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks so much for joining us again. This feels significant. It is significant, but in my mind, it's not surprising. What was really significant was the fact that the district court judge enjoined the DOJ from using documents in an ongoing criminal investigation. The circuit court is basically following the law, so they're doing, frankly, what the district court should have done below. And so what does this mean now as far as the special master that was appointed? It seems like that's kind of a moot point almost. It is with respect to the classified documents, Lindsay. Um, that whole special master thing with classified documents, that was a frolic and a detour. And so at this point, do you expect that Trump's team will then appeal this decision? I think they will. Um, I think they've shown that they're going to litigate every point at every stage and take every opportunity they can. Uh, I can see them trying to get an en banc uh, hearing, meeting all the judges of the 11th Circuit to decide on this. Um, so I think they're going to fight. And we talked about this earlier. It seems that the special master even uh, seems a little skeptical and suggesting that, again, like this, the three uh, judge uh, counsel just found out that they're saying uh, it, it feels like Trump's lawyers are not providing enough uh, significant or any documentation to suggest that, that Trump needed or declassified these documents. Exactly. And he, they never did. They didn't do it before the district court, which is why everyone was surprised. Why is the district court having a special master? to look into this, the special master said the same thing. Wait, there's no evidence that there was any declassification or any need. And now the, the 11th Circuit has found the same thing. And, and let's talk about uh, Ginny Thomas, also a new development here, a wife of Supreme Court uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, she is now agreeing voluntarily to talk to the January 6th committee. 
Uh, I think that is significant. Um, she's not making the January 6th committee subpoena her. Uh, and we'll see maybe one day what her testimony is. I think down the line, the fact that she is testifying and is potentially a fact witness uh, may have implications for Justice Thomas with respect to any case that ever goes up to the Supreme Court that may involve uh, the testimony of his wife. The plot thickens all around. Con Nowaday, we appreciate you once again. And there's other news tonight regarding former President Trump, who's also dealing with bombshell accusations by New York's Attorney General. She has accused President Trump and his children of staggering fraud, inflating the president's net worth by billions of dollars. Aaron Katursky has the latest. Tonight, former President Trump, three of his children, and his top executives are accused of, quote, staggering fraud in a $250 million lawsuit that threatens to cripple the family business. <laughs> New York Attorney General Letitia James says Trump's carefully crafted billionaire brand was built on lies that for 20 years, with the help of Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka, and Eric Trump, the former president grossly inflated his net worth by billions of dollars. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. In her 220-page lawsuit, James accuses Trump of preparing hundreds of fraudulent financial statements, overstating the value of nearly every major property he owns, from golf courses to hotels to his own triplex apartment in Trump Tower, which in 2015 he presented to Barbara Walters as proof of his success. You are a winner? I think so. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I'm think. looking around. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's so. a lot of I gold think here. I've done pretty yeah. well. According to the lawsuit, Trump valued the apartment at $327 million, a price James called absurd. She says it's worth one-third that amount, and that Trump claimed it's three times larger than it actually is. And then there's his current home, Mar-a-Lago. The lawsuit claims Trump valued it at $739 million, nearly ten times higher than what James says it's really worth, closer to $75 million. She alleges Trump did it to trick banks into lending him money on more favorable terms than he deserved. She cites a $160 million loan he got after claiming this building, 40 Wall Street, was worth more than $700 million. In truth, James says it was worth less than a third of that. And she noted a regular person could never get away with something like this. Donald Trump falsely inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself and to cheat the system, thereby cheating all of us. The attorney general wants the Trumps to pay up to $250 million, and she's asking a judge to bar the former president and his three eldest children from ever running a business in New York again. In a statement, the Trump organization calls the suit unethical political harassment and an abhorrent abuse of power. Some scathing assertions there from New York's Attorney General. Aaron Katersky joins us now. Aaron, this is a civil case. Where does it go from here? Lindsay, this one is a civil case, but tonight the Attorney General Letitia James says she has found evidence of potential bank fraud. So she is referring her investigation's findings to both federal prosecutors here in New York and the District Attorney's Office here in Manhattan, which already has an open criminal investigation involving Trump. Trump, of course, faces criminal probes in Georgia over his efforts to overturn the election and in Florida, where the Justice Department has been investigating classified materials retrieved from his home, Mar-a-Lago. Lindsay? Multiple pending cases against him. Aaron Katersky, our thanks to you. Now to the war in Ukraine, President Biden spoke before the U.N. today where he called on other nations to condemn Vladimir Putin's, quote, brutal, needless war. The president's speech came just hours after Putin addressed his nation, issuing a veiled threat to use nuclear weapons, saying, quote, this is not a bluff. Putin also ordered a partial draft, calling up 300,000 more reserve troops, a move that has sparked protests and arrests in Moscow and other Russian cities. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest. Tonight, President Biden on the world stage, facing down Russia as Vladimir Putin moves to escalate the war. Just today, President Putin has made overt nuclear threats against Europe. Now, Russia's calling, calling up more soldiers to join the fight. And the Kremlin is organizing a sham referenda to try to annex parts of Ukraine. Biden reminding the world that Russia wants to erase Ukraine from the map. This war is about extinguishing Ukraine's right to exist as a state, plain and simple, and Ukraine's right 
to exist as a people. That should make your blood run cold. Biden rallying support for Ukraine after a rare address by Vladimir Putin to the Russian people. Predictably, Putin playing the victim. But warning, Russia is willing to use nuclear weapons. Saying those who try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know that the prevailing winds can also blow in their direction. Adding, this is not a bluff. And with Western officials estimating Russia has lost 20,000 troops in six months of war, Putin now calling up 300,000 reservists to fight. After the speech, many airline flights out of Russia selling out, some people buying one-way tickets. This risky move by Putin sparking protests tonight in more than 30 Russian cities with hundreds arrested. A draft making the war more real for Russians and harder for the Kremlin to hide the death toll in Ukraine, a nation where many Russians have family or friends. And in another major escalation, Russia staging referendums in areas of eastern and southern Ukraine in the coming days, planning to annex those regions, claiming an attack there will be an attack on Russia. Greetings to all people of the world. Tonight, President Zelensky addressing the UN via video link, saying Russia should be stripped of its veto power in the UN Security Council. Ukraine demands punishment for trying to steal our territory. Punishment for the murders of thousands of people. With the rhetoric ramping up, Russia striking Ukrainian cities like Kharkiv hard. We felt the blast when missiles hit this apartment block full of families overnight. You can see that part of the top of the building is now missing. After major military setbacks in this region, Putin signaling he's willing to escalate this war again. The growing concern tonight that if Putin feels cornered, he may become even more dangerous. Many are concerned about that. Tom Sufi Burge joins us now from Kharkiv, Ukraine. And Tom, we saw another major development in the region where we heard today that two Americans fighting with Ukrainians who were captured back in June were freed. What's the latest on that? Yeah, Lindsay, Alex Druki and Andy Huynh, both U.S. veterans from Alabama, went missing in June when they were fighting for the Ukrainians in this region. They were part of a group of 10 prisoners of war who were all freed in a prisoner swap agreed by Russia and Ukraine. They're now in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman helping negotiate their release. The two Americans should be on their way home soon. Lindsay? Tom, in Ukraine for us once again, thanks so much. Today, President Biden condemned Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats as irresponsible and delivered this warning. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce was at the UN for the president's speech today. Uh, Mary, how is the White House team responding to these new threats from Putin? Well, Lindsay, while they are certainly taking this very seriously, the White House is also making a conscious effort not to escalate this. They do not want to get into a rhetorical tit-for-tat with Russia over the threat of a nuclear war. So instead, the White House is stressing that Putin's comments are irresponsible, but they say not unusual, that he has threatened this in the past. But, Lindsay, the White House does see that Putin is growing increasingly desperate. And that kind of desperation from an unpredictable leader armed with nuclear weapons is certainly cause for concern. Yeah, that kind of desperation, very dangerous. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. For more now, let's bring in ABC News contributor and retired Colonel Steve Ganyard. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for, for your time and joining us tonight. Is this announcement about an additional 300,000 troops and admission by Putin that, that he's losing this war? I think it is, Lindsay. I think it's the first time he's had to publicly admit that he's losing the war. And we actually heard his uh, Secretary of Defense uh, put numbers on it and say that there are some 5,000 Russian dead when we know, in fact, that there are at least four times that many. So first time he's had to admit to his people that Russia is not doing well. Not only that, that they may lose the territory that has been taken over the last seven months, but also territory that was taken back in 2014. So this was not a not a good, happy talk with uh, Mr. Putin. Was Having with his people, because in addition to that, he was asking for 300,000 new conscripts. Yeah, not a happy talk at all. After word that there may be a draft, we've seen the images all day now, Russians actually fleeing the country. How would a possible draft change this war and the public opinion in Russia? 
Yeah, up until this point, Putin has not made the Russian people suffer, uh, say, in the, in the way that they did during the Soviet days or during World War II. So it's been an inconvenience for the Russian people, but it's mostly been his professionalized military that's on the front lines doing the fighting and dying. Anytime you go to a general mobilization or even a draft, you're asking of a huge, uh, uh, it's a huge price to pay for the society. Think about what happened during the Vietnam War, what the uh, draft did to U.S. society and the turmoil it caused. That's what Putin is doing, because there's no way he's going to find 300,000 reservists, which means that all these people running for the exit see clearly that he's going to have to start pulling military-age uh, men off the street and putting them in uniform. So this now becomes an issue directly for the, for the uh, Russian people in a way that it hadn't been before. It will be their sons and daughters now fighting and dying in Ukraine. And a really critical question for you here, Steve. I mean, talk about Putin's nuclear comments. Are these serious, in your opinion, or, or more bluster? Yeah, Lindsay, I think there are three audiences he was talking to here. The first uh, would be the, the world population. So when any of us hear the idea or the word nuclear and nuclear weapon, that's scary, and we need to be concerned about that. But that's what Putin wants to do. He wants to scare the world. He wants the world to think he's a madman. Don't push me or I'll use nuclear weapons. But then there was another probably that the U.S. government was listening closely to that Putin was intending to say, and that is, I'm going to talk about nuclear weapons because I want to use that as a deterrent. Do not escalate. Do not send long-range weapons into Ukraine that could go and, and target uh, Russia. So if the U.S. government was listening, they might have heard a little bit of a different story that's one of, the, one of those where, don't push me or I might do this. Then there's third and most important audience was the Russian people. He was asking them for an extraordinary sacrifice, not just for 300,000 uh, fresh troops, but what that will cost, what he will have to do to rearrange the economy. So the, the individual Russian citizen is going to feel the effect of what Putin has been asking for. And so he needed to, you know, pump up his chest, pound his chest and say, I'm still going to protect the motherland and if it gets really bad, I'm willing to go and use nuclear weapons. So again, three different audiences with th should have heard three different messages. And finally, taking a step back for a moment, well over six months into this conflict, did you think that it, there was a chance that Ukraine might be in this position where not only has it held back some key Russian advances, but now troops are actively taking back territory that was lost? There were a number of military analysts around the world who said the Ukrainians would do well against the Russians, that they didn't think the Russians would be able to, to conquer all of uh, Ukraine and that the Ukrainians would be able to push it back. There was nobody who predicted how absolutely miserable the Russian military would perform on the battlefield. And so this is part of why we're seeing these really surprising gains. There were people who thought that the, the Russians would be able to be stopped, but now we're looking at the, at, uh, the possibility of actually going back and retaking parts of, of, uh, of the Donbass that were taken in 2014, and perhaps even parts of Crimea. That's where it's going to get uh, dangerous, because if that happens, then Mr. Putin's future will be in jeopardy. Colonel Steve Ganyard, we thank you as always for your time and insight. Back to the economic situation here at home and how it's impacting your bottom dollar. The Federal Reserve announced it's raising interest rates again in an attempt to try to slow inflation, making it the fifth increase this year alone. Joining us now is ABC News' chief business and economics correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis. So, Becky, what does this interest rate increase mean for Americans who are looking for relief from rising prices? So, Linz, it will eventually hopefully mean that relief is here. We've seen gas prices, for example, down more than a dollar since June, but groceries, rents, those continue to climb, and that is a real problem for Americans, especially because wages are not keeping up. At the same time, when you see interest rates rise, it means more expensive borrowing costs. So your credit card bills get bigger if you're, if you're carrying a balance, and it's more expensive to make new big purchases like cars and homes, which require loans. The Federal Reserve Chair signaled they'll continue to raise rates to try to bring down inflation. But can they do that without sparking a recession? It's going to be tough. Uh, this is much more art than it is science. There are plenty of people here on Wall Street who believe, Lindsay, that they started too late, that they should have begun hiking interest rates sooner in order to combat inflation, which they misjudged as being transitory when it really picked up last year. The issue now is that in order to really put a screech on some of the spending that's driving prices higher, they will also put a crimp in other areas of the economy, and that can spill over into areas 
areas like unemployment, which is why so many are casting a mild recession late this year or early next. LD, back to you. <laughs> All right, Rebecca Jarvis, our thanks to you as always. One group hit hardest by rising interest rates are those looking to buy a home. After a boom in home prices and a red-hot housing market during the pandemic, the Fed's move to raise interest rates has now made the cost of a mortgage even higher for those still on the hunt. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has this story. When Emily Brown's daughter Cora was born, the family soon realized their two-bedroom apartment was too small. There's no place for her really to play and crawl and walk around. Emily, a math teacher in Washington, D.C., and her husband, an Army vet, had saved up to buy their first home. We realized quickly that the rates had gone up, which would increase our monthly payment. Soaring mortgage rates forced the Browns to cut their budget for a new home from $500,000 to $400,000 and to make other sacrifices too. We had to give up on some of the things we wanted, like a garage, less square feet, um, and even farther out from D.C. than we had originally planned. Their realtor, Jay Nix, says the Browns are among a growing group of first-time home buyers squeezing their budgets and making trade-offs as mortgage rates spike. People are you know, changing their budget. They're also changing location sometimes. Um, it also may be changing the size of the home. For the first time since 2008, the average rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage is now above 6%, double the rate at the start of the year. According to Bankrate, that's an additional $500 a month for a borrower taking out a $300,000 loan. The higher borrowing costs are the result of an aggressive campaign by the Federal Reserve to fight sky-high inflation. Their main tool for doing that is to raise interest rates, which makes it more expensive for people to borrow money. The housing market is just kind of like collateral damage to get the economy back on track. It did kind of put us in a pickle. Fifth grade teacher Wesley Robinson and his family started building a new home in Arkansas last year when interest rates were close to 3%. With the low interest rates, we thought, hey, now if we're going to ever upgrade, now's the time. But as the pandemic stalled construction and the Fed kept raising rates, their new home only got more expensive. Their mortgage rate ending up at 5% instead of 3 it was frustrating and it did add, I don't know, three, four hundred dollars to the, you know, potentially monthly costs to our mortgage. Now, Wesley fears higher rates might scare off buyers for their old home. We don't want our home to sit there for weeks and weeks unsold. So we're already think, like we kind of need the money. <laughs> Realtors say many home buyers who locked in low rates are now waiting to sell. With a limited supply of homes keeping prices high, Many aspiring buyers are putting their home ownership dreams on hold. Have you at all considered just saying, forget it, I'm not going to buy, I'm just going to keep renting until these rates go down? If nothing comes up or there's nothing that sort of um, is affordable, then, you know, I will just wait. After renting in Maryland for seven years, Simone Jacobs is trying to buy a property for the first time. So this weekend I've looked at about six houses. With her budget stretched, she's expanding her search to new neighborhoods and older homes. Some of the places that we've looked at are sort of time capsules from the 1950s or 60s. But there is a flip side of higher costs keeping buyers on the sidelines. Fewer bidding wars in a housing market that's been red hot for more than two years. Real estate brokerage Redfin reports the market is cooling off in some West Coast cities, including Seattle, Las Vegas, and San Jose, California. The good news is that you can get your offer accepted much more easily now because you're not facing as much competition. But the bad news is that the mortgage is going to be much more expensive. One big problem for home buyers stuck on the sidelines, rents are rising too. Government data shows rent costs increased 6.7% in August from a year before, the biggest spike in nearly 40 years. If you wait a couple more years, your rent keeps going up and then you have to deal with the added expense of higher prices and more competition in the housing market. After crunching the numbers, Emily Brown and her family took the leap into home ownership. Ready for more play space? Set to close next month on their first home. We really just thought about if we continue to rent, you know, that money could go towards the mortgage. So you really put those teacher math skills to use in this equation. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's a big life decision, so you got to do the math. Next to the monster Hurricane Fiona, now a Category 4 storm with sustained winds of 130 miles per hour. Tonight, a hurricane watch is in effect for Bermuda. The outer bands could reach there tomorrow night. While tonight in Puerto Rico, the massive cleanup is now underway. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is in Bermuda, where they are bracing for Fiona's wrath. Tonight, hurricane hunters flying inside Fiona's eye. 
The storm, some 800 miles across. The Category 4 hurricane now churning north toward Bermuda. All of the fresh water here in Bermuda is stored in residential tanks like this one. It's actually rainwater that's captured off these specially designed limestone roofs. This past summer has been so dry, people have had to actually buy water. So they'll take the rain. But as sturdy as some of these homes look, not all will be able to withstand a Cat 4 storm. Fiona gaining strength after making its first landfall in Puerto Rico Sunday night then slamming the Dominican Republic and the Turks and Caicos. At least four dead across the Caribbean. The amount of destruction becoming more clear. In Puerto Rico, more than a million customers still don't have power, and temperatures feel like they're around 100 degrees. Many families displaced, struggling with what comes next. This is a school that's been converted into a shelter. Our Victor Okendo meeting Carla Castro and her two teenage sons at this shelter outside San Juan. Have you gone back to your house? Has regresado a tu casa? Fui ayer, pero está todo patas arriba, todo lleno de fango, los matres, todo está todo inundado. She went yesterday. She says that her house is a total loss. It's just a mess. She shows him video of her flooded home. Wiping away tears, she says her priority is her two sons, who are due to start school. She doesn't know how long she can stay in the shelter, but she has nowhere else to go. Rob joins us now from Bermuda. Looks relatively calm behind you. What's the latest with Fiona? Well, it's about 600 miles now to our south, but today we've seen some of the outflow clouds spiraling overhead, and hurricane watches are now posted for the island. The anxiety is rising here. Satellite picture shows the eye still very well defined, still menacing looking, and the cloud deck and wind field continues to expand. Nothing but warm water and moist air ahead of this thing, so it will stay Category 4, potentially strengthen over the next 24 hours. Forecast from the National Hurricane Center brings it just to the west of Bermuda early Friday morning, and then into Atlantic Canada, Canada early Saturday morning. By then, it'll be extra tropical, but a very damaging storm. All the while, big waves, rip currents, and high surf will be impacting the east coast. Here's one of our computer models showing the progression away from Turks and Caicos. Finally, just west of Bermuda early Thursday morning. We are Friday morning. We're on the bad side of this storm, which means if it, dra it jogs at all to the east, I mean, things are going to get really bad here in Bermuda. So anxiety levels, as we mentioned, are certainly high. All right. Lots of action in the Atlantic. It has woken up. We have several areas of concern. The most concerning is the one heading into the wave heading into the Caribbean. Most of our computer models bring this to hurricane strength through the Caribbean and into or close to the Gulf of Mexico by next week. So everybody from Florida really to Texas and maybe even the Carolinas need to be on alert for that. But first, we got to get through Fiona here. Lindsay. Yeah, first things first. Rob, our thanks to you. Stay safe. When we come back, a three-year-old is fighting for his life after nearly drowning in Lake Michigan, and a family member is accused of pushing him in. Bringing a music legend to life on screen, Jaime Camille tells us how he approached his role as music icon Vicente Fernandez and nailed his signature singing voice. But first, the race to November is heating up. We're running with Beto O'Rourke, who's facing a tough contest as he tries to become Texas's first Democratic governor in decades. He tells us about his strategies for the campaign trail and what he hopes will catapult him over the finish line. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. I gotta go. Ah! Don't get that old camera. Ah! Don't get that old camera. I can't turn back. Get it. I'm ready for election night. I'm ready for debate night. I'm ready for it all. This in the terms it's really important. It will definitely shape the 2024 presidential election. I'm not ready. Gas me out. I promise I don't cry this much. <laughs> and I gotta grab and go and go. Boom. Hey, I'm looking happy. Nice to meet you with ABC News. Well, we're definitely ABC. Miles Cohen, nice to meet you, Senator Scott. It don't matter who it is, baby. We ain't gonna take no for an answer. Hi, everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. <laughs> These seem to be setting up as perhaps the most consequential midterm in our lifetime. There's some pressure. What would George do? George would ask the next question. We're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. What's the point of being an embed if you're not going to go all in? A three-year-old boy is now fighting for his life after police say his aunt pushed him into Lake Michigan and then allegedly made no attempt to try to rescue him. Victoria Morena was denied bond during a court appearance today on attempted murder and aggravated battery charges. Investigators say divers with the fire department pulled the child out of the water and rushed him to the hospital in full cardiac arrest. He's still listed in very critical condition at a local hospital. We are now less than 50 days until the midterm elections, and tonight the race for governor in the Lone Star State is heating up. Former Congressman Beto O'Rourke is now back on the trail after a brief bacterial infection sidelined him. He faces the tough task of trying to become the first Democratic governor in Texas in decades. What's his plan to beat Governor Abbott, and will he win over independent voters? In the Texas heat, we got a chance to run with O'Rourke and see what makes him tick during the long and grueling campaign season. It's the first in our series race to November. We're really racing, huh? Ready, set, go. It's yet another race for Beto O'Rourke. Turns out this 49-year-old husband and father of three has stamina. That was not a fair start. He says he doesn't miss a morning. Every day, seven days a week, this six-foot-four former congressman runs at least four miles. So you never listen to music while you run? No. On this scorching like... late summer morning, we asked to join him. So you ran for Senate, ran for president, now running for governor. I take it you like to run. <laughs> well, I want to serve. This is a big moment of truth for us. The rights that we perhaps have taken for granted for women, the right to make their own decision about their own body or the right to marry the person of your choosing, all of that is under attack and on the line right now. Good to be with you. Hitting the ground running has become part of his routine. That's what I want to do for you as president of the United States. He's run for president. Please welcome Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke here. The senator. In to get to work in Congress. And now the former congressman is running again. Our next governor of This time for governor of Texas. Are you ready to sign up and to be part of this campaign? O'Rourke, one of the most prominent Democrats in the country... It should be a Texas where it's you and me. It's ...is now going head-to-head -head against Greg Abbott in one of the most consequential races of O'Rourke's political career. The most expensive race in Texas history that polls suggest is now a single-digit contest. The last time a Democratic candidate won a statewide election in Texas was 1994. It was Ann Richards. She was never ahead in the polls. Not only did she win, but she became one of the very best governors. We're bringing that same kind of Ann Richards spirit to this. Whatever qualms people may have about O'Rourke, the man does have endurance. What do you say, though, to people who say, man, you're just a perennial candidate. Whatever office is open, you're running for it. I just point them to the 83,000 people who signed up so far to join this campaign. This is what winning the governor's race on November 8th looks like.
It looks like all of you. He's trying to convince crowds like these that his brand of politics, which he says is all about bringing people together, is the solution to the Lone Star State's increasing divide. It was said once before that you were too wholesome, too innocent, too decent to become president. Do you think that was a fair assessment? No, I don't know who said that, but um, no, I, I tell you, I am who I am. What I try to do is bring everybody in. And I mean, I don't know if that's wholesome or what, but I just, I feel like that's a very Texas value. You're my fellow American. You're my fellow human being. I think when we start treating one another that way, everything is possible. The campaign trail is often grueling. For O'Rourke, it's especially long and circuitous. Over a 49-day stretch, he's traveling in excess of 5,600 miles through more than 60 counties. I want to partner with local communities. With rallies and runs all along the way. This is my kind of runner. I love to talk while I run. I never find people who like to, to talk and run at the same time. I like it, too. I like being able to have a conversation with someone. It distracts you from the pain you might be feeling or the fatigue that you're sensing. What do you love about running? clears my head. It allows me to see the bigger picture. I also need it to like disconnect from the the day-to-day -day, moment to moment and just be doing something that's physically hard. I can have two hours of sleep, three hours of sleep and I go run and I'm recharged. Hey, I believe. On this particular morning, he's campaigning in one of the reddest counties in a predominantly red state, Abilene, Texas, where 80% of voters supported Trump in 2016. But enthusiasm for O'Rourke is growing. He speaks to the humanity in every person. I like him. Running during the summer in Texas is intense and not for the faint of heart. But what O'Rourke seems to take to heart is the saying that one run can change your day, many runs can change your life. It's as if he's always testing the limits of just how far he can go. This is totally predictable. Like this moment back in May when he interrupted Abbott's press conference about the shooting at Robb Elementary. You are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. He explains his sometimes fiery rhetoric behind what he believes is one of the biggest problems facing his state. It may be funny to you, but it's not funny to me. You were recently heckled uh, when you brought up Uvalde. What is your plan to tackling guns into the state? Universal background checks, a red flag law, raising the minimum age of purchase for an AR-15. These are things that most of us can agree on. We have three kids who are in the public schools in El Paso. They and millions of other kids across the state are no safer today than they were on the last day of school at the end of the last school year. Um, the same week that 19 children were slaughtered in their classroom. Another polarizing issue, the Texas-Mexico border. Governor Abbott has bused thousands of migrants from across Texas to major U.S. cities, some from O'Rourke's hometown of El Paso, something the former congressman says is nothing more than a political stunt that's further driving the divide across the state. Does Texas have an immigration problem? Texas has a leadership problem. We have a governor who treats the legitimate challenges we have at our border as an opportunity to score political points. If you're coming to traffic fentanyl, if you're coming to traffic human beings, right now you're a needle in a haystack. We move the haystack out of the way by having a safe, legal, orderly way for people to come here to work, to join family, to seek asylum, then we can go after those who seek to do us harm. Years ago you said, I was born to be in it, I want to be in it. What is it? serving, being with people. We're looking forward to winning this race. With and the former congressman insists his message of unity has never been more important. Whether you voted for Biden, whether you voted for Trump, whether you've never voted at all, um, I want to serve you, I want to work with you. A sentiment he hopes will carry him across the finish line first in the race to November. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Today. Oh, man, thank you. Just one of several more to come, and that was not a fair start. But our thanks to Beto O'Rourke for going on the run with us. Still ahead here on Prime, the plea deal reached for one of the former officers charged in the killing of George Floyd. There could be a major change coming from your car, what a government agency is pushing to include in every vehicle. Yankees player Aaron Judge poised to make history. We take a look at his astounding season so far by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, it's equal payday for black women across the country country.
Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Special Agent Simone Clark, FBI. It's my first day. I'm not 25. I gotta shine right out the gate. Not on my watch. You promised not to get fired in the first five minutes, remember? No. Look out! FBI, tell me your hand! It's okay. We got this. We're fans. This was a crime of emotion, of violence. What the state said is not lining up, and what he's saying lines up. We did not make a mistake. Leo is an innocent man. <laughs> My dad, he had nothing to do with it. Most people will tell you when they're behind bars that they're not guilty. What makes you different? It's true. Amy Robach reporting the all-new season premiere of 2020, Friday on ABC. Welcome back. New York Yankees right fielder Aaron Judge appears to be headed for their record books, possibly with multiple entries. Here's a look at his astounding season so far by the numbers. 60 home runs in a single season. Only five players in the history of the major league have accomplished that feat until Judge joined the exclusive club last night. His 111 mile per hour blast soared 430 feet far into the left field bleachers. The right hander now tied with Babe Ruth for the second most home runs by New York Yankee and just shot one homer of Roger Maris's 1961 American League record. And at just 147 games into the season, he's well ahead of both Ruth and Maris, leading many to say it's a question of when, not if, he'll break the record. But Judge is not likely to break the Major League record of 73 home runs this year. That's held by Barry Bonds, who set the mark in 2001. That surpassed the 1998 home run chase by Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, who both bested Ruth and Maris that year. But Bonds McGuire and Sosa have all been tainted by accusations of steroid use. Judge also has baseball's triple crown in his sights with a 316 batting average and 128 RBIs. He has a chance to become the 11th player ever to lead the league in three statistical categories in the same season. And one more bit of baseball trivia for you. Judge's home run last night came off of a pitcher whose great great uncle was teammates with Babe Ruth in the 1930s. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. After scathing report and calls for his resignation, the owner of two basketball teams makes a big decision about his future in sports. Plus, remember that $1.3 billion Mega Millions winning ticket from July? Someone just claimed it. First, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Outsiders come to Alaska to disappear or to reinvent themselves. Which is it? I came for a job. I'm a reporter. Her death is part of a pattern. And we need to show who's to blame. The cops, the politicians, no one's going to help. Why? We're going to break this story. Saturday, an ABC News live music event, Global Citizen Festival, with performances by the Jonas Brothers, Metallica, SZA, Usher, Thames, and Mariah Carey, with appearances by Hugh Jackman, Chris Martin, Billy Porter, Connie Britton, Rachel Brosnahan, and hosted by Denai Guerrera and Priyanka Chopra Jonas, united to change the world. Global Citizen Festival, Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. New York Attorney General Letitia James announcing a $250 million civil suit alleging fraud by former President Donald Trump, three of his children, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric, the Trump Organization, and two of its executives, including Alan Weisselberg. In their filing, the Attorney General's office laying out decades of examples they say show Trump and his business overvaluing real estate holdings and other assets, allegedly deceiving lenders and insurance brokers with misleading financial statements. James saying Trump was then able to take out loans based, among other things, on his allegedly overblown net worth, something James says average Americans can't do. It is a tale of two justice systems, one for every day, working people, and one for the elite. Trump denies any wrongdoing. A full day for President Biden at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. The president's main focus in his speech Wednesday, Russia's war on Ukraine. Ukraine has the same rights that belong to every sovereign nation. We will stand in solidarity with Ukraine. We will stand in solidarity against Russia's aggression, period. The president condemning Russian President Putin, who has now ordered a partial mobilization as he tries to ramp up the size of his military, threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Today, President Putin has made overt nuclear threats against Europe and a reckless disregard for the responsibilities of the non-proliferation regime. 
one of the four officers involved in the death of George Floyd, sentenced again. Thomas Lane, the former Minneapolis police officer who held George Floyd's legs in May of 2020, his fellow officer Derek Chauvin pinned his knee on Floyd's neck, was sentenced to three years in prison on a state charge of aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. Lane is already in federal prison in Colorado, serving two and a half years for violating Floyd's civil rights. Faced with a growing controversy over racial and sexual comments, the owner of NBA and WNBA franchises in Phoenix is he's selling. Robert Sarver says he is beginning the process of selling his teams, the Phoenix Suns and Mercury. It comes eight days after he was suspended by the NBA and fined $10 million for allegedly saying a racial slur multiple times and making sexual comments towards staff. In a statement, Sarver says selling is a best course of action. He said in the current unforgiving climate that it's become clear keeping the teams is no longer possible. Well, the National Transportation Safety Board is recommending new technology that could help prevent drunk drivers from getting behind the wheel of a car. The agency is recommending all new vehicles come with alcohol impairment detection systems or advanced driver monitoring systems. Officials say this would prevent a vehicle from being operated if it detects the driver is impaired. The NTSB needs the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to now sign off on the recommendation. The mystery Mega Millions winners finally coming forward in Illinois, sort of. Lottery officials say two people who had agreed to share the winnings have come forward privately. They will share the ticket worth more than $1.3 billion. Two months later, they have now finally collected that prize. They want to remain anonymous. They are splitting the money, taking the lump sum, by the way, of more than $780 million. Not bad. As we continue to highlight Latino stories during Hispanic Heritage Month, we explore the story of the king of traditional Mexican music, Vicente Fernandez, a legend who sold more than 50 million copies worldwide with a repertoire consisting of Mexican classics like El Rey and Volver, Volver. to that music there, played at weddings, quinceañeras, even funerals. Vicente's music is a staple among many Latinos. Paying homage to this international icon's legacy is Jaime Camille, a Mexican actor best known in part for his hit role as Rogelio de la Vega in Jane the Virgin. Jaime, thank you so much for coming on the show. Lindsay, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, let's take a quick peek at the preview of the series appropriately named El Rey, which of course means the king. Oiga, pa, mm. yo ya no quiero ir a la escuela. ¿Y qué va a hacer? Quiero cantar. Lo siento mucho, amigo, pero me pidieron que te suspendiera el contrato. Y aquí de la disquera están a punto de sacarme por la puerta de atrás. O les demuestro lo que valgo, o me regreso a Guadalajara a ordeñar vacas. Jaime, you play the role of iconic musician Vicente Fernandez. Bring us back to the moment that you found out that you were going to portray this iconic singer. Oh my God, I, I almost fainted. Can you imagine the responsibility and the weight on my shoulders? But, uh, but you know, I approached it like any other acting gig because if you let fear or hesitation get programmed in, in your performance, then you set up yourself for, for failure, right? But it was, it was a, a beautiful project, blessed by Vicente himself and his family. It is the authorized biopic. And, uh, you know, we wanted to be, we wanted to be as far away from a, a parody or imitation or caricature as possible. And while you were in production, did you have any flashbacks to your childhood of growing up in Mexico? A hundred percent. I mean, of course, I, I'm from Mexico and I love my country, obviously. And, 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 even, and even though Vicente was more an, an artist for my parents, not so much for my uh, generation, everybody knows who Vicente Fernandez is and everybody sings his songs, at, like you very well said, in parties, quinceañeras, even at funerals. So, yes, can you imagine? I mean, just playing. Vicente Fernandez is for, for mariachi music what Elvis Presley was mm. for rock and roll, basically. And how does one become and, and prepare for this role, becoming the king of rancheras? 
Well, you know, we had great acting coaches, and, and I, I researched uh, an unlimited amount of material of Vicente in intimate scenarios. Not so much the Vicente singing or Vicente in his films, because Vicente in films is like is like an exaggerated ver exaggerated version of Vicente. So I really wanted to to get the the essence and the vibe of him in in intimate scenarios. We really wanted the character to have a lot of gravitas and and, and to really connect emotionally with the audience. And of course, his voice just, you know, belted uh, across and resonated across any room. We see moments in the series where people would actually stop at the sound of his voice. You actually sing in the series yourself. How long did it take you to master his cadence and what was that process like? Oh, my dear God, it, it was a process. It was very difficult, very challenging, but very, very artistically rewarding because I, uh, I, I recorded every single song in his original key in his original tone of the of the song and uh, so in the studios I had the, the, the music I had my voice of course and I had a knob with Vicente's voice so what was important to me was to paraphrase uh, or you know in this artistic interpretation of what we were doing uh, with our Vicente in a way was to really mimic his phrasing and how you know the the, the classic he caress songs like in, in a very like este amor you know the cadence of, of how he sang that was very important for me to to imprint in the recording perfect because i was just going to ask can i put you on the spot and just get you to give us a taste and you did that <laughs> it's, it's difficult it's <laughs> listen a voice is like a fingerprint and no one ever is going to sound like vicente no one no one ever is going to have that that but that, that power that vocal power but you know it was just like um, he did like things like this. Um, este amor apasionado anda todo alborotado. You know, it's, you got <laughs> it. Very, you nailed it, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in, in the series, there's a famous line that Vicente recites: "You'd never die if people don't forget you." A, a true testament to his legacy, for sure. What do you hope the audience takes away from from watching his story? You know, we are playing an homage of uh, the, the great Vicente Fernandez. So, so we really want uh, people to connect uh, with him and to see him as a human being that 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 had to overcome so many obstacles and struggles in life to become what what he became and what he still is. He single-handedly put mariachi music in the worldwide map. So that's uh, an, an impressive achievement. Hi, mate. We thank you so much for, for gracing us with that voice of yours as well. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Sharing a piece of your Mexican culture, El Rey Vicente Fernandez is now streaming on Netflix. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Actor, theater critic, and trans woman Susie Wrong, pictured in Sydney, Australia, posing in a dress made showing the national flags of 71 nations where it is still illegal to be LGBTQ+. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of today's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, including news of a major ruling giving a win to the Justice Department in its investigation into former President Donald Trump. And we speak with acclaimed director Darren Aronofsky. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following breaking news tonight. A panel of judges has granted a request from the Justice Department to stay portions of a ruling by a Florida judge that had effectively paused the government's investigation into former President Trump's potential mishandling of classified records after leaving office. The three-judge panel, comprised of two Trump appointees and an Obama appointee, ruled unanimously the DOJ is no longer prevented from using the documents with classifications recovered from Mar-a-Lago and will no longer have to submit Submit them to special master Deary for review. In the ruling, they say Trump, quote, has not even attempted to show that he has a need to know the information contained in the classified documents. They also agree with the DOJ that the Trump team submitted no record or claim that he ever declassified the documents at issue. For more on this breaking development, we're joined once again by ABC News contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks so much for joining us again. This feels significant. It is significant, but in my mind, it's not surprising. What was really significant was the fact that the district court judge enjoined the DOJ from using documents in an ongoing criminal investigation. The circuit court is basically following the law, so they're doing, frankly, what the district court should have done below. And so what does this mean now as far as the special master that was appointed? It seems like that's kind of a moot point almost. It is with respect to the classified documents, Lindsay. Um, that whole special master thing with classified documents, that was a frolic and a detour. And so at this point, do you expect that Trump's team will then appeal this decision? I think they will. Um, I think they've shown that they're going to litigate every point at every stage and take every opportunity they can. Uh, I can see them trying to get an en banc uh, hearing, meeting all the judges of the 11th Circuit to decide on this. Um, so I think they're going to fight. And we talked about this earlier. It seems that the special master even uh, seems a little skeptical and suggesting that, again, like this, the three uh, judge uh, counsel just found out that they're saying uh, it, it feels like Trump's lawyers are not providing enough uh, significant or any documentation to suggest that, that Trump needed or declassified these documents. Exactly. And he, they never did. They didn't do it before the district court, which is why everyone was surprised. Why is the district court having a special master? to look into this, the special master said the same thing. Wait, there's no evidence that there was any declassification or any need. And now the, the 11th Circuit has found the same thing. And, and let's talk about uh, Ginny Thomas, also a new development here, a wife of Supreme Court uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, she is now agreeing voluntarily to talk to the January 6th committee. Uh, I think that is significant. Um, she's not making the January 6th committee subpoena her. Uh, and we'll see maybe one day what her testimony is. I think down the line, the fact that she is testifying and is potentially a fact witness uh, may have implications for Justice Thomas with respect to any case that ever goes up to the Supreme Court that may involve uh, the testimony of his wife. The plot thickens all around. Khan Nowaday, we appreciate you once again. And there's other news tonight regarding former President Trump, who's also dealing with bombshell accusations by New York's Attorney General. She has accused President Trump and his children of staggering fraud, inflating the president's net worth by billions of dollars. Aaron Katursky has the latest. Tonight, former President Trump, three of his children, and his top executives are accused of, quote, staggering fraud in a $250 million lawsuit that threatens to cripple the family business. <laughs> New York Attorney General Letitia James says Trump's carefully crafted billionaire brand was built on lies that for 20 years, with the help of Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka, and Eric Trump, 
the former president grossly inflated his net worth by billions of dollars. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. In her 220-page lawsuit, James accuses Trump of preparing hundreds of fraudulent financial statements, overstating the value of nearly every major property he owns, from golf courses to hotels to his own triplex apartment in Trump Tower, which in 2015 he presented to Barbara Walters as proof of his success. You are a winner? I think so. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I'm think. looking around. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's so. a lot of I gold think here. I've done pretty yeah. well. According to the lawsuit, Trump valued the apartment at $327 million, a price James called absurd. She says it's worth one-third that amount, and that Trump claimed it's three times larger than it actually is. And then there's his current home, Mar-a-Lago. The lawsuit claims Trump valued it at $739 million, nearly ten times higher than what James says it's really worth, closer to $75 million. She alleges Trump did it to trick banks into lending him money on more favorable terms than he deserved. She cites a $160 million loan he got after claiming this building, 40 Wall Street, was worth more than $700 million. In truth, James says it was worth less than a third of that. And she noted a regular person could never get away with something like this. Donald Trump falsely inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself and to cheat the system, thereby cheating all of us. The attorney general wants the Trumps to pay up to $250 million, and she's asking a judge to bar the former president and his three eldest children from ever running a business in New York again. In a statement, the Trump organization calls the suit unethical political harassment and an abhorrent abuse of power. Aaron Katursky reporting for us now to the war in Ukraine. President Biden spoke before the U.N. today where he called on other nations to condemn Vladimir Putin's, quote, brutal, needless war. The president's speech came just hours after Putin addressed his nation, issuing a veiled threat to use nuclear weapons, saying, quote, this is not a bluff. Putin also ordered a partial draft, calling up 300,000 more reserve troops, a move that has sparked protests and arrests in Moscow and other Russian cities. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest. Tonight, President Biden on the world stage, facing down Russia as Vladimir Putin moves to escalate the war. Just today, President Putin has made overt nuclear threats against Europe. Now, Russia's calling, calling up more soldiers to join the fight. And the Kremlin is organizing a sham referenda to try to annex parts of Ukraine. Biden reminding the world that Russia wants to erase Ukraine from the map. This war is about extinguishing Ukraine's right to exist as a state, plain and simple, and Ukraine's right to exist as a people. That should make your blood run cold. Biden rallying support for Ukraine after a rare address by Vladimir Putin to the Russian people. Predictably, Putin playing the victim, but warning, Russia is willing to use nuclear weapons. Saying those who try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know that the prevailing winds can also blow in their direction, adding, this is not a bluff. And with Western officials estimating Russia has lost 20,000 troops in six months of war, Putin now calling up 300,000 reservists to fight. After the speech, many airline flights out of Russia selling out, some people buying one-way tickets. This risky move by Putin sparking protests tonight in more than 30 Russian cities with hundreds arrested. A draft making the war more real for Russians and harder for the Kremlin to hide the death toll in Ukraine, a nation where many Russians have family or friends. And in another major escalation, Russia staging referendums in areas of eastern and southern Ukraine in the coming days, planning to annex those regions, claiming an attack there will be an attack on Russia. Greetings to all people of the world. Tonight, President Zelensky addressing the UN via video link, saying Russia should be stripped of its veto power in the UN Security Council. Ukraine demands punishment for trying to steal our territory. Punishment for the murders of thousands of people. With the rhetoric ramping up, Russia striking Ukrainian cities like Kharkiv hard. 
We felt the blast when missiles hit this apartment block full of families overnight. You can see that part of the top of the building is now missing. After major military setbacks in this region, Putin signalling he's willing to escalate this war again. The growing concern tonight that if Putin feels cornered, he may become even more dangerous. That is the concern of many. Our thanks to Tom. Today, President Biden condemned Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats as irresponsible and delivered this warning. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. ABC's senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce was at the UN for the president's speech today. Mary, how is the White House team responding to these new threats from Putin? Well, Lindsay, while they are certainly taking this very seriously, the White House is also making a conscious effort not to escalate this. They do not want to get into a rhetorical tit-for-tat with Russia over the threat of a nuclear war. So instead, the White House is stressing that Putin's comments are irresponsible, but they say not unusual, that he has threatened this in the past. But, Lindsay, the White House does see that Putin is growing increasingly desperate. And that kind of desperation from an unpredictable leader armed with nuclear weapons is certainly cause for concern. Yeah, that kind of desperation very dangerous. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. Now to that big decision today from the Federal Reserve. For the third time in a row, the Fed is raising interest rates by 0.75 percent in the hopes of tamping down inflation and the high prices that we're paying on everything from food to clothes. ABC News' chief business and economics correspondent Rebecca Jarvis has the details. Tonight, in the fight against inflation, the Federal Reserve raising that key interest rate by another three quarters of a percentage point. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't. Today's hike, the third since June, will make new car and home loans more expensive. You'll also pay more on your credit card. Take, for example, the average balance, about $7,000. If you're making minimum payments, today's hike could cost you an additional $416 in interest. Mortgage rates, which have doubled since January to more than 6%, are heading higher too. In Washington, D.C., math teacher Emily Brown and her family have outgrown their rental, so she crunched the numbers. It's a big life decision, so you gotta do the math. The only way they could afford to buy was to cut their budget by $100,000. We had to give up on some of the things we wanted, like a garage, um, less, square, less square feet, um, and even farther out from D.C. than we had originally planned. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that. Now to some other headlines we're monitoring here at ABC News. The governor of Wisconsin is calling for a special session of the state legislature in his latest attempt to repeal a criminal abortion ban dating back to 1849, which suspended some abortion services in the state after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June. The governor has ordered the state legislature to act on his proposals on October 4th. Former First Lady Michelle Obama will travel across the country this fall on a tour for her new book, The Light We Carry. The book was inspired by the challenges of the past several years, including the coronavirus pandemic, political turmoil, and the divide in our country, as well as conversations she's had with loved ones and others. Venezuelans surpassed Guatemalans and Hondurans to become the second largest nationality stopped at the U.S. border after Mexicans last month. The increase from July to August was a whopping 43 percent. Venezuela has one of the world's highest inflation rates, and about three-quarters of the population lives on less than $2 a day. The United States' strained relationship with Venezuela's government makes it extremely challenging to expel Ven Venezuelan migrants. We are now less than 50 days away until the midterm elections, and tonight the race for governor in the Lone Star State is heating up. Former Congressman Beto O'Rourke is now back on the trail after a brief bacterial infection sidelined him. He faces the tough task of trying to become the first Democratic governor in Texas in decades. What's his plan to beat Governor Abbott, and will he win over independent voters? In the Texas heat, we got a chance to run with O'Rourke and see what makes him tick during the long and grueling campaign season. It's the first in our series race to November. We're really racing, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yet another race for Beto O'Rourke. Turns out this 49-year-old husband and father of three has stamina. That was not a fair start. He says he doesn't miss a morning. Every day, seven days a week, this six-foot-four former congressman runs at least four miles. So you never listen to music while you run? No. On this I'm scorching like... late summer morning, we asked to join him. So you ran for Senate? Ran for president, now running for governor. 
I take it you like to run. <laughs> well, I want to serve. This is a big moment of truth for us. The rights that we perhaps have taken for granted for women, the right to make their own decision about their own body, or the right to marry the person of your choosing. All that is under attack and on the line right now. Good to be with you. Hitting the ground running uh, has become Mr. part Yang, of his routine. You. That's what I want to do for you as president of the United States. He's run for president. Please welcome Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke here. The senator. In to get to work in Congress. And now the former congressman is running again. Our next governor of This time for governor of Texas. Are you ready to sign up and to be part of this campaign? O'Rourke, one of the most prominent Democrats in the country... It should be a Texas where it's you and me. It's ...is all. now going head-to-head -head against Greg Abbott in one of the most consequential races of O'Rourke's political career, the most expensive race in Texas history that polls suggest is now a single-digit contest. The last time a Democratic candidate won a statewide election in Texas was 1994. It was Ann Richards. She was never ahead in the polls. Not only did she win, but she became one of the very best governors. We're bringing that same kind of Ann Richards spirit to this. Whatever qualms people may have about O'Rourke, the man does have endurance. What do you say, though, to people who say, man, you're just a perennial candidate. Whatever office is open, you're running for it. I just point them to the 83,000 people who signed up so far to join this campaign. This is what winning the governor's race on November 8th looks like. It looks like all of you. He's trying to convince crowds like these that his brand of politics, which he says is all about bringing people together, is the solution to the Lone Star State's increasing divide. It was said once before that you are too wholesome, too innocent, too decent to become president. Do you think that was a fair assessment? No, I don't know who said that, but... Um, no, I, I tell you, I am who I am. What I try to do is bring everybody in. And I mean, I don't know if that's wholesome or what, but I just, I feel like that's a very Texas value. You're my fellow American. You're my fellow human being. I think when we start treating one another that way, everything is possible. The campaign trail is often grueling. For O'Rourke, it's especially long and circuitous. Over a 49-day stretch, he's traveling in excess of 5,600 miles through more than 60 counties. I want to partner with local communities. With rallies and runs all along the way. This is my kind of runner. I love to talk while I run. I never find people who like to, to talk and run at the same time. I like it, too. I like being able to have a conversation with someone. It distracts you from the pain you might be feeling or the fatigue that you're sensing. What do you love about running? clears my head. It allows me to see the bigger picture. I also need it to like disconnect from the the day-to-day -day, moment to moment and just be doing something that's physically hard. I can have two hours of sleep, three hours of sleep and I go run and I'm recharged. Hey, I believe. On this particular morning, he's campaigning in one of the reddest counties in a predominantly red state, Abilene, Texas, where 80% of voters supported Trump in 2016. But enthusiasm for O'Rourke is growing. He speaks to the humanity in every person. I like him. Running during the summer in Texas is intense and not for the faint of heart. But what O'Rourke seems to take to heart is the saying that one run can change your day, many runs can change your life. It's as if he's always testing the limits of just how far he can go. This is totally predictable. Like this moment back in May when he interrupted Abbott's press conference about the shooting at Robb Elementary. You are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. He explains his sometimes fiery rhetoric behind what he believes is one of the biggest problems facing his state. It may be funny to you, but it's not funny to me. You were recently heckled uh, when you brought up Uvalde. What is your plan to tackling guns into the state? Universal background checks, a red flag law, raising the minimum age of purchase for an AR-15. These are things that most of us can agree on. We have three kids who are in the public schools in El Paso. They and millions of other kids across the state are no safer today than they were on the last day of school at the end of the last school year. Um, the same week that 19 children were slaughtered in their classroom. Another polarizing issue, the Texas-Mexico border. Governor Abbott has bused thousands of migrants from across Texas to major U.S. cities, some from O'Rourke's hometown of El Paso, 
something the former congressman says is nothing more than a political stunt that's further driving the divide across the state. Does Texas have an immigration problem? Texas has a leadership problem. We have a governor who treats the legitimate challenges we have at our border as an opportunity to score political points. If you're coming to traffic fentanyl, if you're coming to traffic human beings, right now you're a needle in a haystack. We move the haystack out of the way by having a safe, legal, orderly way for people to come here to work, to join family, to seek asylum. Then we can go after those who seek to do us harm. Years ago you said, I was born to be in it, I want to be in it. What is it? Serving, being with people. We're looking forward to winning this race. With and the former congressman insists his message of unity has never been more important. Whether you voted for Biden, whether you voted for Trump, whether you've never voted at all, um, I want to serve you, I want to work with you. A sentiment he hopes will carry him across the finish line first in the race to November. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. What a good sport are things to Beto O'Rourke for that. And still to come, days of widespread protests in Iran turned deadly. What's fueling the demonstrations? Acclaimed director Darren Aronofsky is moving away from movies for his latest project, writing a book. He tells us about what it was like to try a different form of storytelling and how the publication uses inspiration from his own childhood. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. A three-year-old boy is now fighting for his life after police say his aunt pushed him into Lake Michigan and then allegedly made no attempt to try to rescue him. Victoria Morena was denied bond during a court appearance today on attempted murder and aggravated battery charges. Investigators say divers with the fire department pulled the child out of the water and rushed him to the hospital in full cardiac arrest. He's still listed in very critical condition at a local hospital. We are now less than 50 days until the midterm elections, and tonight the race for governor in the Lone Star State is heating up. Former Congressman Beto O'Rourke is now back on the trail after a brief bacterial infection sidelined him. He faces the tough task of trying to become the first Democratic governor in Texas in decades. What's his plan to beat Governor Abbott, and will he win over independent voters? In the Texas heat, we got a chance to run with O'Rourke and see what makes him tick during the long and grueling campaign season. It's the first in our series race to November. We're really racing, huh? Ready, set, go. It's yet another race for Beto O'Rourke. Turns out this 49-year-old husband and father of three has stamina. That was not a fair start. He says he doesn't miss a morning. Every day, seven days a week, this six-foot-four former congressman runs at least four miles. So you never listen to music while you run? No. On this scorching like... late summer morning, we asked to join him. So you ran for Senate, ran for president, now running for governor. I take it you like to run. <laughs> well, I want to serve. This is a big moment of truth for us. The rights that we perhaps have taken for granted for women, the right to make their own decision about their own body, or the right to marry the person of your choosing, all of that is 
under attack and on the line right now. Good to be with you. Hitting the ground running has become part of his routine. That's what I want to do for you as president of the United States. He's run for president. Please welcome Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke here. The senator. In to get to work in Congress. And now the former congressman is running again. Our next governor of This time for governor of Texas. Are you ready to sign up and to be part of this campaign? O'Rourke, one of the most prominent Democrats in the country... It should be a Texas where it's you and me. It's ...is now going head-to-head -head against Greg Abbott in one of the most consequential races of O'Rourke's political career, the most expensive race in Texas history that polls suggest is now a single-digit contest. The last time a Democratic candidate won a statewide election in Texas was 1994. It was Ann Richards. She was never ahead in the polls. Not only did she win, but she became one of the very best governors. We're bringing that same kind of Ann Richards spirit to this. Whatever qualms people may have about O'Rourke, the man does have endurance. What do you say, though, to people who say, man, you're just a perennial candidate. Whatever office is open, you're running for it. I just point them to the 83,000 people who signed up so far to join this campaign. This is what winning the governor's race on November 8th looks like. It looks like all of you. He's trying to convince crowds like these that his brand of politics, which he says is all about bringing people together, is the solution to the Lone Star State's increasing divide. It was said once before that you were too wholesome, too innocent, too decent to become president. You think that was a fair assessment? No, I don't know who said that, but... Um, no, I, I tell you, I am who I am. What I try to do is bring everybody in. And I mean, I don't know if that's wholesome or what, but I just, I feel like that's a very Texas value. You're my fellow American, you're my fellow human being. I think when we start treating one another that way, everything is possible. The campaign trail is often grueling. For O'Rourke, it's especially long and circuitous. Over a 49-day stretch, he's traveling in excess of 5,600 miles through more than 60 counties. I want to partner with local communities. With everywhere. rallies and runs all along the way. This is my kind of runner. I love to talk while I run. I never find people who like to, to talk and run at the same time. I like it, too. I like being able to have a conversation with someone. It distracts you from the pain you might be feeling or the fatigue that you're sensing. What do you love about running? clears my head. It allows me to see the bigger picture. I also need it to like disconnect from the the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, and just be doing something that's physically hard. I can have two hours of sleep, three hours of sleep, and I go run, and I'm recharged. Hey, I believe! On this particular morning, he's campaigning in one of the reddest counties in a predominantly red state, Abilene, Texas, where 80% of voters supported Trump in 2016. But enthusiasm for O'Rourke is growing. He speaks to the humanity in every person. I like him. Running during the summer in Texas is intense and not for the faint of heart. But what O'Rourke seems to take to heart is the saying that one run can change your day, many runs can change your life. It's as if he's always testing the limits of just how far he can go. This is totally predictable. Like this moment back in May when he interrupted Abbott's press conference about the shooting at Robb Elementary. You are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. He explains his sometimes fiery rhetoric behind what he believes is one of the biggest problems facing his state. It may be funny to you, but it's not funny to me. You were recently heckled uh, when you brought up Uvalde. What is your plan to tackling guns into the state? Universal background checks, a red flag law, raising the minimum age of purchase for an AR-15. These are things that most of us can agree on. We have three kids who are in the public schools in El Paso. They and millions of other kids across the state are no safer today than they were on the last day of school at the end of the last school year. Um, the same week that 19 children were slaughtered in their classroom. Another polarizing issue, the Texas-Mexico border. Governor Abbott has bused thousands of migrants from across Texas to major U.S. cities, some from O'Rourke's hometown of El Paso, something the former congressman says is nothing more than a political stunt that's further driving the divide across the state. Does Texas have an immigration problem? Texas has a leadership problem. We have a governor who treats the legitimate challenges we have at our border as an opportunity to score political points. If you're coming to traffic fentanyl, if you're coming to traffic human beings, right now, you're a needle in a haystack. 
We move the haystack out of the way by having a safe, legal, orderly way for people to come here to work, to join family, to seek asylum. Then we can go after those who seek to do us harm. Years ago, you said, I was born to be in it. I want to be in it. What is it? Serving being with people. We're looking forward to winning this race. With and the former congressman insists his message of unity has never been more important. Whether you voted for Biden, whether you voted for Trump, whether you've never voted at all, um, I want to serve you, I want to work with you. A sentiment he hopes will carry him across the finish line first in the race to November. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Today. Oh man, thank you. Just one of several more to come, and that was not a fair start. But our thanks to Beto O'Rourke for going on the run with us. Still ahead here on Prime, the plea deal reached for one of the former officers charged in the killing of George Floyd. There could be a major change coming from your car, what a government agency is pushing to include in every vehicle. Yankees player Aaron Judge poised to make history. We take a look at his astounding season so far by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, it's equal payday for black women across the country country. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! Finally tonight, a high school senior in Upton, Massachusetts is a standout on the football field, a team leader and an inspiration. Nick Brine lost his hearing when he was just three years old, but that has not stopped him from achieving his dreams. Reporter Josh Brogadier from our partner station WCVB has his story in our local lowdown. He lost ability to use his processors, they weren't working, and they came up with their own signs. All the players came up with their own signs they were gonna use during the plays. Nick went back out there, played the whole game without hearing anything. On that day, this is how Nick Byrne experienced football. Some people don't even know that I'm deaf when I'm on field. Any questions? All right, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Compare his experience to his teammates at Nipmuc Regional High School in Upton. Go! This is how they always experience football. We didn't allow him to play football until he bagged and pleaded with us, right? It was helmet hitting, with him wearing a uh, implant, that was certainly a question. Nick uses one cochlear implant while he plays and has a helmet specially fitted. And yet, this is a story about what he can do on the football field, not what he can't. Nick, as a senior, can lead his team. Nick, as a starting defensive lineman, can crush ball carriers. Hey, boys. What's going on, Bernie? Nick can be, make that is, a consummate teammate for the Nipmuc Warriors. Always been supporting me and always been with me on the field and off the field, too. Of no, I always I want to say good, I want to thank you guys for everything you did for me. No, never give up on your dream. No, and never let anyone get in your way. Because I had some people who were in my way say, hey, you can't do this. Hey, deaf people can't do this. Never give up your dreams. That's right. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night.